All right, uh, this is my talk, how to use copywriting uh, to sell your game without feeling sleazy, okay? Um, we're just gonna start real right in the middle. Um, why should you care about this? this is, we're just gonna get right in the bass tax here. So uh, copywriting really is just filling in empty boxes. Like you don't realize it when you're doing game dev, but if you need to get your game out there in the market, you're just constantly filling these boxes that just say things like description. Uh, this is Twitter, you've got a Tweet about your game, another empty box. Uh, you know, you, if you're sending out email newsletters, more empty boxes. Really, half our, my job is just empty boxes. Like even if you do uh, YouTube, you still have to worry about your headlines and all kinds of stuff. This is me, I was actually on a, a YouTube podcast. The guy picked like the weirdest video screenshot for me. It's really weird. So I didn't have any choice in that, but he just picked that for me. So that, um, and there's always some social media, like there's some new platform, like how do you use all these? It's just, it's just a mess, right? Um, really just, when I say copywriting, I just, I don't mean the legal term, I just mean the text that you put in those empty boxes. That's essentially what copywriting is. And really what I want to do is, is teach you how to love this stuff. Like I know it sounds terrible and all you wanna do is make games and you just wanna release them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hopefully teach you tonight like how to love this stuff. Okay, so um, there's the most important thing that I'm gonna teach you though tonight is to always have a call to action. That's like the most important thing we can do. Okay, um, so if you're wondering how to go viral, I can't teach about that. There's, there's just no way to go viral reliably, it's just a thing. Really I'm teaching you the strategies, the real stuff, not flash in the pan, gimmicks or anything. I want to teach you real underlying skills to be a good copywriter. Um, so this is, this is me, this is who I am. Um, I've released a, a lot of games on Steam. I've got two games out there right now. Uh, my first one was One Screen Platformer. Before that, I released a lot of mobile games. I've, I think this is my sixth game. I make small indie games, retro style. And while making these games, I uh, just kind of picked up copywriting and I kind of do that in my own job. Um, I write about all my marketing that I've done on my website called howtomarketagame.com. Surprisingly, that was not taken. I didn't have to pay anybody off to howtomarketagame.com. Turns out nobody knows how to make, market a game. I still don't know. We're all still learning. Um, and also, according to um, John 69.69420, I am the most enthusiastic I've ever seen in the history of Steam. So I am like apparently the most enthusiastic developer on Steam, according to John 42, 420.69.69. Um, I've also, my games, um, I've figured out kind of a secret sauce to getting on Imgur. I've been on the front page of Imgur four times, um, and then a couple other times really close to the front page, but not quite. So I've kind of cracked that code, and I'll teach you about that. Uh, this picture right here is, uh, this is a, a Catholic graveyard by my house, and I went by at Halloween, and a, their family decorated the gravestone with a fake gravestone. I really thought that was going to go viral. It didn't. But I still think it's funny. It's like a guy's decorated as a gravestone. I don't know. But I didn't go viral. Only 16 people upvoted it. You never know. That's why I say you can't figure out how to go viral. OK. Um, also, in the fifth grade, I wrote Quest of Courage, uh, which was basically just a, a retelling of all the video games I played. Uh, the left are my illustrations. The right are the actual source games. It was basically Dragon Quest and Ultima 8, I think that one is. Uh, it was just me writing basically my stories that I was doing in my head while I was playing video games. Um, and I won the Harbinger House Award for my fifth grade writing. Uh, they didn't know what to do with me, so they put me under historical fiction. <laughs> I don't know, but, but apparently it was historical fiction. So I say I've been a content marketer for video games since I was 10 years old. That's, so I've been doing this a long time, folks. Like, I'm almost 40. So 30 years of video game content marketing. That's right here. Okay, so, um, but I also kind of grew up uh, and turned this into a consulting gig. So I've done marketing consultations for Puzzle Nation. Uh, they, they are the digital arm of Dell Penny Press, those magazines you see at the checkout aisle, and uh, a free play company called Beta Dwarf based out of Copenhagen. So I've done a lot of consulting to how to do this marketing for them too. So uh, that's what I'm here to do is really just pep you up so that uh, you find out how not to feel sleazy about doing all this stuff. I really, I really feel like this can be something you could love if you just take the red approach for it. Uh, I don't want you to feel like this used car salesman. I mean, you know, this is good. This is good. Um, and the reason people think of sales as like used car salesman is that's typically what is coercion. Like you're tricking somebody into a sale. But really good copywriting and good sales is, it's like at Christmas time when you find the perfect gift for somebody who didn't know they needed it. 
you're not, when you're selling your game, you're not tricking somebody into buying your game. You're just finding the audience that is predisposed to like your game. And then you just show them and they say, my God, this is the game that I've always wanted. I just didn't know it existed. That's what marketing is. It's finding the right people and proving to them that it's actually the game that they've always wanted. It's not coercion. So um, there's a very famous marketer named Zig Ziglar. He said this quote that I love, which is selling is essentially a transfer of feelings. And I think that is so true. You were just transferring your enthusiasm about your game to them. And the reason I wanted to do this talk was these are actual marketing quotes that I pull out of weird newsletters that I get from other indie devs. Like these are actual quotes that people do to, to sell their game is a very rare dispatch or I hope you don't mind getting this email or if you're not interested, you can unsubscribe, but forever be forewarned, I will cry. Like that's what people are selling. And if, if sales is a transfer of emotion, this is the emotion they're transferring to people who are gonna buy your game. So don't do this. I really wanna stop those feelings and get you to feel confident about actually selling your game. Okay, so before we can do anything, we gotta start what's called a sales funnel. I don't know if you've ever learned it, but it's the fundamental of marketing. Um, it's basically, it's really easy. It's called awareness, interest, desire, action. And it's just a, a mental model for how people interface with your game. Before they buy your game, any one person is gonna become aware of it, become interested in it, desire it, and then take action, which just means buying your game. Uh, this is uh, from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. This is Alec Baldwin also teaching Ada, which is the funnel, see? It's a very famous uh, mental model. Um, and basically all we're doing when we're selling to somebody is we're getting from the top to the bottom. And you win, that's it. That's all you gotta do is top to bottom. So let me just, it's really easy to explain how this kinda goes. Let me just show you an example. So uh, let's say you're, you've got a game and you're trying to market it. You post it on Reddit and you go viral. Like it's just one of those viral front page posts. Those people went from not knowing you existed to becoming aware that your game exists. And a certain population of those people are gonna kind of follow you and find out this game's actually pretty awesome. They're gonna follow you on Twitter. They are now in the interest phase. They're just slightly interested in your game. But you do some good tweets, uh, you really write well about your game, and you put a link to your Steam page, and the people who follow you on Twitter and like your stuff, oh, they're starting to desire it. They are now in the desire phase. They're like, I can't wait for this game. They wish list it. They push the wish list button, and they are just waiting for your game to release. And then when you do, you put a nice sale on there, 75% off, hopefully not that much, and they are like ready to take action. That right there is a funnel. That's how people go from the top to the bottom and they buy your game. Nobody just goes from awareness instantly to sales. It just never, ever, ever happens, except for like gum at the check-in aisle. It's the only time like somebody sees something and then buys it without even like thinking about it. Okay, now the reason it's called sales funnel and it's shaped like that is because sadly a very huge number of people are gonna see it on the front page of, of Reddit, like 500,000 people hopefully, millions sometimes. But by the time each level they drop off. A, a certain portion of those people are going to drop off so that by the time you're at the bottom, even if you go super viral, only about 100 people are actually going to buy it. These are non-scientific numbers, but it depends on your game, but typically you're going to see a huge fall off all the way down. That's why you, going viral isn't just enough. So the reason that is, is because you have to do all these jumps on the platform. So you have to go from all these different companies with different logins, different ways of interacting, like going from Reddit to Twitter, Twitter to Steam, Steam back again to buy it, you're making a lot of jumps and you're gonna lose a lot of people along the way. And the reason is, that's where copywriting comes in. That's how we can get them through that. So when you go most viral, like Imgur, this is actually my post that I put when I was on the front page of Imgur, like that's the front page, um, you get this feeling where people are like, I want to just give you money. There are gonna be people that are there ready to do that. And you have to channel that energy because that actually, even though there's totally exciting, you're on the front page, it lasts literally like 30 seconds because there'll be another post that comes up and then they're like that excited about the next thing that comes. So you have to figure out how to like channel that energy into the right way. So how do you channel this? How do you actually get people to go there? Um, you, gotta, you gotta channel them to something productive, which is to follow you. And you know what that also is called? A call to action. You always have to have a call to action because you're channeling somebody who's interested and wants to buy into doing something. So you always need a call to action. And all a call to action is just a very clear sequence of steps. Like, what do you want me to do? What, what do I do now that I, I'm totally attracted to your game? That's it. You're just telling what to do. But it's such a hard thing to do. You'll hear this all the time like on YouTube, like ring that bell, follow and subscribe. These are all just call to actions. That's, that's all they are. 
So when you don't know, you always have to be ready with this because you don't know when something's going to go viral. Like sometimes you just, you work really hard on something and it doesn't go viral. And then some other thing, you just cast out some random post on Twitter and that could go viral. So you always have to be ready for what to do if it does catch, go viral. So you should always be thinking of that call to action. Um, a lot of people are like, well, I'll get some visibility with it. It doesn't count. People, there's just too much stuff on the internet. You can't go viral. Visibility just doesn't count. Okay, so basically a call to action are just the, is kind of the mortar between every level of the funnel. That's all a call to action is. It helps them transition between all these different platforms and all these different companies. I can't emphasize this enough. Always have a call to action. Okay, so you guys got it, right? Call to action, call to action. Building that funnel. How do we not lose our mind in marketing? Okay, like, and the reason is there are so many social media platforms. There's a new one every day, some new hot thing that's the new hotness. There's no way to, to be on all of them. And even if you did, you wouldn't have any time to do anything else. And even if you did, like, sign up for all of them, there's such a crazy map of call to actions. Like, even your followers wouldn't be able to follow this. So what you basically do is funnels are a great way to think so you can prioritize, like, which ones you use. For instance, um, not all social media fits at all levels of the funnel. Things that are top of the funnel for awareness, when you go viral, that's all top of the funnel awareness stuff. So those are like your Reddits, your Twitters, your Imgers, your Twitch, your Facebook, all things where you could post and all of a sudden all these people who had never heard of you all of a sudden become, and become aware of you. That's why these are very good top of the funnel things. And, but ironically, a, oops, a lot of things that are kind of good top of the funnel are not good middle of the funnel. They don't really help people because just by the nature of the way the systems work, good middle funnel uh, social media platforms are like discords or email marketing, which is my favorite, and I'm gonna teach you how to do email marketing, and then Twitter, but I put a little asterisk on there because everybody thinks Twitter's good mid funnel. It's not. Twitter's not actually that good mid funnel. It's a secret. Um, and like, think about it. A lot of these mid funnel things really aren't good at going viral. For instance, nobody goes viral on Discord, right? Like when you post, you're just kind of like local within that thing. Everybody who's on that Discord channel knows who you are. They're already aware. They've already gone through the awareness phase. Okay? And then bottom of the funnel, which is action, are all the stores, any store where you buy your game. Okay, so for me, I, I say if you're just starting out marketing, don't do all the things. Pick your, the ones that you like best that you really do enjoy doing. Uh, for me, I love Imgur, and I've kind of figured out the, the, the ethos and the way they talk. So I like Imgur, and then my middle funnel, I use email marketing and I, because it's the best. And then uh, the bottom, I put my games on Steam. So this is what my funnel looks like. Now, I do some Discord, and I do some Twitter, but this is my primary. And it's always good to know what your primary funnel looks like and which platforms you've picked. And this is why thinking in the term of funnel really helps, because you get to know, like, oh, I'm missing something mid-funnel. I don't have a good mid-funnel uh, platform yet. Okay, so we got that plan, right? What do we do with it? We should just say, buy my game a thousand times every day. Don't do that. Do not just say, buy my, buy my game. You're just going to lose every, every follower that you possibly have. Um, this is where some good copywriting comes in, okay? So... Um, this is how you talk to your funnel and really get people to love you. Um, there's three parts here. First, you've got to understand your audience, build a relationship with them, and then tell them what to do. Okay? That's it. It's not too hard. Uh, let's talk about understanding your audience. Um, really, what you're doing is you're just studying like apes out in the wild, but my, my customers are not apes. They are just full human beings. But sometimes you've got to take this, uh, this this mindset like you're an anthropologist and really learning where that audience is. Now, you might not know who your audience is, uh, but um, once you learn who they are, really good how they, who they are, if you can state your problem better than they can, they will trust you. They're like, you knew me better than I knew myself. I will throw money at you. Um, that's a very good way of just get, earning that trust. And the best thing I like to think about are, like, you know those stupid late night ads? They actually, even though they're cheesy, the black and white parts, they actually know the problems pretty well. Like they amp it up to, to 11 because most of the people watching these are either high or totally stoned, but they really do have that, that problem. Like, oh yeah, I do sometimes drop my tray or sometimes the water is a little too hot or I hope that's what's going on with the guy on the left. But they really have understood the problem and they're just putting it right up front of there. Again, if you know your audience's problem, you can market to them a lot better. 
So we make video games like, what kind of problems do video game people have? You've obviously never read Steam because everybody has problems. There are a thousand negative reviews for every game. People have a lot of problems in video games that you don't understand. Like for instance, if you didn't know it, being able to change the controls on Steam is like a huge deal. Everybody wants to be able to customize their controls. Um, I like to make games with lots of achievements and achievement hunters hate the no death achievement. If you have a no death achievement, because it's very hard to get and achievement hunters really just want to rifle through a game and get all the achievements, they hate that. So you got to learn what your audience hates about games and make sure you tailor your message and maybe put into your game design a little bit of that. So watch this. What I do is identify my audience first and you might say, oh, they're hardcore gamers. That's wrong. Your audience is not hardcore gamers. Uh, it's close. They might be. There's very, very specific audiences for each genre. And what I've done a lot of research on how people buy games on Steam, and people are very genre sticky. I mean, look at us. We came out tonight to not even play video games together, just to talk about video games. We are not the typical audience. We probably have, we play tons of different types of games. We are game students. We, we go far ends of the earth. We're not typical. The average game player just picks one, two, three genres tops, and they just barrel in on those, and they play those over and over again. So you've got to really understand most players aren't genre, they're very genre monogamous. So what you do is you identify the game that you're making, look at the top game, the top selling game. Everybody knows what the top selling game, like if you're making a, a roguelike, it's probably like Dead Cells, or if you're making an FPS, it's probably like a Halo or Destiny. Just go in and look at those um, reviews for that top game. Also look at the mediocre game, the game that didn't sell very well, and look at those reviews too. And you're gonna find pros and cons listed out. And they're just gonna go straight into all your research. And then what I do is I find every reviewer that seems like a nice person, and I just message them and say, hey, can I just chat with you for 10 minutes? I'd like to pick your brain about what you like about video games. I know it's totally awkward, but hey, we make video games. It's still a pretty fun job. So sometimes you gotta take the, uh, the hard parts of the job. So once you talk to them, you don't just say, hey, I'm making a co-op wizard FPS. That's awesome, right? They're always going to say yes because they're nice people. It's, you can't ask them what you're doing. What you actually should ask them is what they did in the past, not what they want. So what you do instead is turn it around and say, what was the last co-op game that you played? Or how often do you play with friends in your own home? If you ask what they've done in the past, that's much more likely to get an honest answer versus saying, I'm doing this awesome thing that I love. Do, am I good or not? They're always going to say you're good and your games looks awesome. So don't do that. Okay, so then what I do is I take all the feedback that I heard a lot of times on uh, Steam, and I look at all the interview topics that I've heard them mention, and I just put them on a chart. And I list all the things that they hate on the left and all the things that they like on the right. And then you can just see very similar things turning up over and over again. And basically, those are those problems that you could turn into an infomercial black and white film. And basically, I keep that list handy because this part when we build your relationship is where you're going to use that. And the key thing to understand is copy when you're writing sales or you're writing your tweets or you're writing email. It's not about you and you making a game. It's about your audience and what's what your game does for your audience. And the idea is like if you look at the marketing for like Nike, they're not actually listing out the features. You don't even know what you're selling here. What are they selling? What they're doing is they're selling the, the concept that everybody's an athlete. And this could be you. You don't know what to buy. It's not saying buy this new shoe or I guess maybe a leotard or maybe her hairband. I don't know what they're even selling in this ad, but they're just saying you want to be an athlete, we make you an athlete. Like this is what Consumer Reports does. That's not what Nike does in their advertising. They really sell the concept of being an athlete. And that's what you really want to do is you want to sell the concept of being this like awesome experience that they are going to experience, not you as a game developer. So remember when we studied our audience, wrote that pro and con list? That's where we use it. We, we write about what they have told us that they like and don't like about games. Like I see a lot of uh, blog posts or updates like, we visited PAX to show off our game. Nobody cares about that. That's like you showing off your trip to like Scotland or something. Like nobody except your mom and maybe your sister likes to see that stuff. Your fans don't care about that. They want to know what's in it for them. Very specific things about what to actually write about. So uh, headlines and subject lines are the most important thing. That's what gets them in there. I'm going to teach you how to write them. Um, so what I like to do is I like to start with my problem list, the chart we made, and then I, I turn that into a headline because I know what they care about. For instance, 
I'm making a Metroidvania and I've done a lot of research and I've found that people really care about the maps. If a game with a Metroidvania has a map that sucks, people hate that game. So I'm gonna write a headline that says, five ways we made the Metroidvania map suck less. And they're gonna be like, that's perfect. I love it when the games uh, have a good map. I also like to build a swipe file. And basically a swipe file is anytime you see a headline that you're like, God, this made me wanna click. I don't even know why this, this is so awesome. I just write that headline in a little text document that I save on my Google Drive. And then I can always reference that if I need to help writing a, a headline or something. And you might not have done this, but what I'd recommend is go to YouTube, go to your search, your video history that you've watched. Chances are the videos that you've watched have really good headlines because you clicked on them. Also go through your red email on the uh, promotions tab of Gmail. All the emails that you read probably have some pretty good headlines. So those are good things that you can just swipe. It's like school. Actually, it's not like school. You can totally copy from somebody else's work. All you got to do is change the words around so that it's actually your game instead of somebody else's game. Nobody's going to call you for plagiarism. Steal, steal, steal. Um, but there's also, don't be ashamed, marketers do this too. We used to buy books of just headlines, but now all you have to do is like Google great email subject lines, and you'll get some well-tested ones. It's totally allowed. You're totally allowed to do it. I'm giving you the freedom to do that. Okay. But we can't talk about, <coughs> we can't talk about um, headlines without talking about clickbait. Everybody hates clickbait, right? Um, I've found that people are so worried about clickbait and being called out for clickbait but they, that they actually start writing really boring headlines. Like I see stuff like Studio News number six or new devlog update. Nobody's going to click on that. That's a boring, boring headline. Don't write those. Um, you got to write kind of catchy headlines, even if you think that they're a little clickbaity. And they like the dramatic headline, but I'll tell you why it's not clickbait. Clickbait is when you promise something and then don't deliver it. Uh, for instance, like, I'm quitting. Dairy. Nobody's going to like that. That's a terrible headline. That's clickbait. But if you um, make something honest, like saying, I quit, and then you actually write a good story about how you quit. I actually wrote, I went super viral. My number one most viral thing was when I actually decided to go full-time doing game dev. I wrote a blog post of my journey to get to how I did. That went to the front page of Imgur straight up. And it was an honest thing. I actually had a catchy headline about quitting, and I delivered on it. That wasn't clickbait because I delivered. So uh, be dramatic with your headlines, but be honest with your headlines. OK, so after we get the headline, they're in. This is the scary part. This is why people pay copywriters, because they fear this gigantic open box that just says description. I'm going to tell you, don't do this. Don't do just a big wall of text. Nobody reads that. Um, the way to actually understand what to write is through uh, understanding of how people actually re read text. Um, if you've got a bunch of text, people actually don't read it top to bottom. They skip the headlines. They read headline one, headline two, headline three. Then they say, what's in it for me? How much is this costing me, buddy? They look down at the bottom because the price and the call to action is always at the bottom. And then they go back up and they jump to the headlines that actually caught their eye or that are appropriate for them and they'll read that little bit of text. And then they'll skip down to any uh, bullet points and kind of pick out bullet points that sound interesting to them. That's how they read. So when I write my copy, all my text, what I do is I write just the heading sections and I make sure that they follow like a sentence. So if I'm writing, a, let's say I was writing copy for Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, mine would be explore an open world, find secret ingredients, and craft destructive potions. Like that's essentially what that is, but those are all just the headlines. And then if somebody is like really into secret ingredients for whatever reason, I'll have a paragraph just describing those secret ingredients. So again, be cognizant. People are skipping ahead and through your headlines and make sure your headlines flow like they're just a one sentence, okay? Um, also, go back to your uh, list of, that you built of what people like and don't like and use that as the key headlines. Again, like Metroidvanias and map making, make sure that's one of your subheads so that people are like, yes, I care about maps. And then they can jump to that section and read just about maps. OK, so what do we do? We understand the audience. We built the relationship. Now let's tell them what to do. Also known as a call to action. Always have a call to action. Every time. Don't miss this. All right, so our sales funnel, again, the call to action are just the jumps between the different levels of the funnel. So let's write one. <clears throat> I see this is almost, literally, I changed it not to offend anybody who may have actually written this, but this isn't actually a game dev 
uh, call to action that I saw. Sorry to bother you. I know you're busy, but my little game came out a few days ago. Be sure to take a look and review, or actually <laughs> take a look and reviews help. And then they put a little link to their game. Okay, so let's clean this up. First thing, remove weak sauce apologies. Just get rid of them. Stop apologizing for your game. People are going to love your game. Don't be apologetic. My game came out a few days ago. Be sure to take a look and reviews help. Okay, next part. It's called a call to action, not call to actions. Make sure you have one thing to do. Just one thing to do. So be sure to look, take a look, and reviews help. That's two things. Strip it down. Okay, now just say reviews help. But guess what? That's passive voice. Nobody likes passive voice. Be very direct what you want them to do. So say, please review it. Just be very honest. Now, what I like to do is before I do any call to action, I click on the link to see what happens when they click the link because your fans are going to be doing that. Guess what? If you tell somebody to review and you leave a little link, look at this page. This is a standard Steam page. There are buttons and boxes all over the place. They are going to get lost before they realize how to review your game. So you got to be super clear what to do. So what I like to do is say, OK, my call to action is please review it. Click the following link, scroll down to the review section, and write one thing you liked about my game and one thing you didn't. Be exactly clear what you want them to do. Then uh, I add a little pathos sometimes. Like at the top, say, you've played my game, I appreciate you, and I need your help with one thing. Just put it up at the top. It just warms them up and gets them to think in, in terms of you and them having a relationship. And then uh, this little link at the end, that's not going to cut it. But a nice, cool button there that says review my game, catches the eye so they can just see it. So that even if somebody doesn't read all this text, they just go and they click that button. Make sure your button has a nice verb right up front, review my game. And then they can just see it. OK? Uh, this is an actual game dev uh, email sending somebody to their merch store. This is just like an email that should be pure money. Like they click this email, and then money comes pouring out because this goes to their merch shop. Can you find the CTA? No, uh, the clue is it's actually this little p highly light pink text. I just blurred it out to uh, not offend the innocent. That's the call to action. Look, it's in the middle of the text. It's just pink text. That's terrible. Have good, strong, clear to actions, call to actions. So um, I'm going to show you a wrap up of everything we've learned and kind of show you some real life examples. Okay, this is my most recent game. It's called Return of the Zombie King. Um, and like I said, my favorite top of the funnel activity is Imgur. I love Imgur. Um, it's really good for, uh, it's like the, the number one secret that nobody's actually using. So what I did was I put on my little investigator's hat, talked to my audience. I found that people who liked my last game are really into retro games. They're very historical. They like history, uh, most recent history and deep history. And they're kind of like in the medieval type of games. Like I looked at similar games. Um, I went to Germany uh, and went to Norse Weinstein Castle. That's for kind of where I was inspired to make this game actually in the first place is this very famous castle. Turns out um, video games are also very inspired by this. Uh, like these are all these old retro 16-bit games that all had this funky castle in them. Um, actually in the uh, Legend of Zelda 2 marketing, it wasn't actually in the game, but the castle, that same castle, Norse Weinstein Castle shows up. So I put a little call out to my game. Look at that. I had my artist for the cover draw a little Norse Weinstein Castle as a nice call out. And what I did was I wrote an Imgur post all about the history of this castle and all the weird places it shows up in video games. And guess what? It made it to the front page. And what else did I do with my Imgur post? Actually, don't. Don't put a call to action in Imgur. Imgur hates call to actions. <laughs> don't do it. Why would you put it in a call? No, I'm just kidding. So what I did was I waited. What you actually do with Imgur is you wait until you get to the front page because people call you a sellout. And then you, add in, you edit in the post at the end. And what you do is you don't make it a direct call to action that says, go buy my game. I actually, again, you turn it back on the audience. So what I said was, I'm looking for some beta testers. You seem like a cool person. Sign up here. And then I had the link. You give it a light touch, and you make it all about the audience, not about yourself. And it comes off a lot better on Imgur. So here's example number two. This is email marketing, and this is why I love email marketing, and I think it's the best. So Minion Masters is a game made by a studio out in Copenhagen. They hired me to improve their marketing, to give them a nice uh, onboarding section for their email. Uh, it's a free-to-play game. It's very similar. Minion Masters, which is free-to-play, is uh, it's kind of like Clash of Clans, but uh, on PC for a more hardcore audience. Um, 
The weird thing about uh, free-to-play games is the funnel is kind of upsy dupsy topsy turvy um, The awareness phase, they'll actually buy it. Like, when they first see it, because the game's free, they're like, heck, why not? And they'll just buy it. So it's not actually, you get to be at the interest phase and install it. You're still not totally sold on the game and you're playing it. The action is actually where they pay the IAP. So the funnel, they're actually playing the game in the mid-funnel, which is weird, right? I mean, it's totally topsy turvy This is the front page of the game. This is what you first start up. Now imagine you've never played this game. You don't even know what it is. This page is totally bonkers crazy and saying like all these like buttons and all kinds of stuff and there's cards up at the top, numbers everywhere. It's a very hard game to get into. And so what I did was I put on my investigator hat like I do for all my clients. So the first thing I ever do for my client is go talk to the customers. I interviewed some potential customers. I looked at reviews, really tried to determine what was going on there. And what I discovered there was it's a very complex game. Their retention is based on uh, the very early days. If they, they bleed out too early, uh, if they leave the game too early, that's, they don't spend IAP. And then we need to establish that relationship, one-to-one -one person. It seems like free-to-play games get that, that kind of feeling of like a cold, hard institution that doesn't care, just wants your money. Uh, they kind of had that weird feeling. And it's a PC game. Uh, the cool thing about mobile games for free-to-play is you're with it on your bus while you're waiting in line at the grocery store. You've always got it. Whereas a PC free-to-play game, they go to work, people leave, they're not at their PC. It's not until they come back home that they actually can like, learn about the game and play it. It's not always in their pocket like a mobile free-to-play game. So they can't talk to them on mobile. So what we did was I inserted a big old fat email marketing uh, awesomeness right in that interest and desire phase. And I'm going to show you how I did it. So what I did was uh, something called an autoresponder. So in email marketing is when you sign up for somebody's email list, it's called an autoresponder is as soon as they sign up, I've pre-programmed a bunch of emails. In this case, nine of them. Taught they get an email every morning. And it taught them the rules of the game because that was a very clear thing that a lot of people were missing. And what we also did was we gave them little gifts. Because it's a collectible card game, every day in this sequence, they got a free collectible card that they could only get through the email list. So on, uh, we were just giving gifts away to these people. And then what we also did was we introduced them to the studio because that's a really important thing. You want people to fall in love with the studio, not just think they're some cold, hard, like, money grabbers. So here's the actual email. This is the CEO right up front. We put him right at the top. His name's Stefan. I put a nice picture of him smiling. I kind of wanted it to be like, remember if you watch the old Disney's, Walt Disney would always introduce the movie every Sunday night and be like, Hello, I'm Walt Disney. Here's my movie, and here's what's going on in Disneyland. I love that feeling. So I wanted to bring that same feeling and make Stefan Walt Disney. So Stefan's right up front there. He's giving a little wink. Um, the other thing we did was right up front those gifts. I guess if you take a screenshot, you can get some free cards if you really want from Minion Masters. But we put the unlock codes for those free cards right at the top. This is the same email, by the way. As you scroll down, every week or every day in this email campaign was about one topic and one topic only. This one was how to rank up in the game. I know that a lot of people had that question. I saw it in the forums. People were like, how do I rank up faster? How do I do that? So what I did was I wrote an email just about ranking up. Guess what we did? Some nice headlines, write big headlines that they could skim through, and then also be able to pick out just basic facts about that they could skip to. Then at the bottom, we did what's called an open loop. And this is like, uh, if you watch that show Lost, you know how each episode ended on a cliffhanger so that you'd come back next week to watch the next episode? You want to do that in your emails. It's called an open loop. So at the end of every email, I told them what they're going to learn about next and what magic card they're going to get next. And then people are like, holy crap, I, gotta get, I can't wait for tomorrow's email. So that actually boosts the open rate of tomorrow's email. Then, finally, what do we do? Always have a call to action. So what we did was at the very bottom, we put a nice big purple button because purple is kind of the company's color. And we did a different call to action every day. In this case, this one on uh, this day was to go to Steam and leave a review. I know there's two call to actions and I told you not to, but it's technical because sometimes it was on, it's on Xbox One and it's on Steam and we have no idea, so we provided two. But sometimes you, you have to do two call to actions. But uh, people will be able to find the right one. So there's the call to action. So here's the results of this. It sounds weird, getting an email every single freaking day. Um, and it's email marketing, right? Email marketing is dead. It's so old. Discord's a hot thing. This is their uh, Discord channel. Turns out Minion Masters and Beta Dwarf has one of the top 10 Discord servers on Discord. Like, top servers. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, the most number of members in their Discord. They're very, they use Discord a lot. And what we did was we did a test. Um, I joined them right when they were launching this new season. 
And so I sent out an email, and, I send, and they sent out um, the same message on the same day on Discord. And I looked at Discord, and I was like, oh my god, they hired me to improve their email. And look at how awesome this Discord is. I mean, look, it's got 96 flame emojis. I was like, email is so boring. And these guys are freaking getting 96 flame emojis. What am I freaking going to do? How am I going to do this? I was like, oh my god, their, their Discord is going to blow away my email marketing that I'm trying to teach them. OK, here's what, these are the results after that campaign. OK, Twitter had a 0.11% open rate. This is why I say Twitter is a terrible middle of the funnel. Nobody clicks on Twitter. Their Discord, which is the new hotness, we've got a Discord. Everybody thinks Discord's so hot. Guess what? 0.7% click rate. Email, 2% click rate. It was more than double both Discord and Twitter combined. And now, these click rates are very low. That's because they're a free-to-play game and they have a very big general audience. But email almost always outperforms by a great deal all other social media platforms. It's boring, it's old, but it goddamn works. OK, so finally, we emailed them every day for nine days. Mondays, weekends, every day, we sent them a magic card, and we sent them uh, a thing to do with Stefan's face on it. Uh, 94, I, I did a survey. So after the nine days, I sent out a survey. I was like, what did you guys think about this nine, to the email subscribers, what did you just think about these nine emails I just sent you? 94% of the folks love the daily emails. So 40% actually wish there were more. They wanted more than daily emails with magic cards in them. And 54% said, just right. Don't do any more, don't do any less, just right. 6% was like, that's a little too much. But all right, I'm OK with 6% saying that's a little too much. <clears throat> and um, sometimes we did send out an email that said, could you please uh, join our beta? Because they had a beta program where you could try out the cards early. And we sent this really personal thing from Stefan. Like, it was Stefan's face. And he said, like, hey, um, you've been really helpful. Can you, uh, I know you've opened all your email, all our emails. Would you like to join our beta? It would be really helpful if you did. And <laughs> we actually got really personal email reply backs that were like, oh man, I just broke up with my wife. I just don't know if I have time for this kind of stuff right now. I'm kind of going through a rough spot. Like we got really personal emails. So like I said, you've got to monitor this stuff and you got to really judge your audience. We actually backed off on that. We kind of like stiffened up the email so it was a little more dry. It wasn't so personal. Sometimes you can overdo the personal. But that's the power of this stuff. Like if you write this stuff really well, you can get some like really amazing results. Okay, that's the end. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I really appreciate it before we go. What? All right, here it is. I really appreciate you coming to my talk. As a special gift to you, I'm going to give you a free copy of my ebook. Um, go to the following link. This is a real link. This is a real thing. Enter your email address, and I will send you a free copy of my ebook. So it's howtomarketagame.com slash free, and you'll get my copy of my ebook. You'll be on my newsletter. I send out a newsletter every single week. Um, it's about marketing, how to market your game, tells fun stories. I just told a fun story about what we can learn from romance indie authors. It's really good. It's really fun, some good stuff. So please join. I'd like to have you. Um, and I'll answer any questions now. I'll just leave this up. I'll just answer questions in front of this thing. So questions. As far as like YouTuber advertising called like Raid Shadow Legends. Oh, OK. Yeah, I haven't heard of it. Yeah, it, it's always one of those um, where uh, someone's like, oh, it's, like I just got in contact. Like the YouTuber themselves, it, it's like one of those personalized kind of marketing. Yeah, I think that's great. Too. Like. Um, uh, YouTube's great because it's great top of the funnel. Think of top of the funnel is anytime somebody doesn't know what your game is to when they do know about it. And that's great if you do a sponsored thing with a thing because you've got that trust there already. Like the people who trust that uh, market, that um, YouTube streamer, they're going to trust their, them saying this is a great game. Um, the thing about YouTube, people post, uh, I didn't put this in the thing, but I should. Um, people post their trailers and it kills me. They always end the trailer on a black screen. It was like put a call to action at the end of your trailer. like. If you just watch this awesome trailer, and you're like, this game looks amazing, and then it just goes to a black screen, and they're just like, oh, OK, look at this video about cats. You know, it's like, <laughs> put a freaking call to action at the end of your YouTube trailer, because it's going to be awesome. Like, people are going to want that. So yeah, that's my thought on YouTube. It's a great platform. Does your book teach you how to send automated email messages? It tells you what to write those automated email messages. Um, but basically, any um, software platform, like, these are specific. Uh, platforms like MailChimp or um, uh, Constant Contact is one of them. They've got this built in. Just search automation and whatever email service provider you do it. It's actually, it's, if you can make a game, you can make an auto 
responder. Like it's like writing um, dialogue for uh, an RPG or something. It's like if they click on this, say this. If they don't click on this, it's super easy and super fun. Uh, so you talked about uh, being detailed in that call to action and providing specific instructions for how to do it. Um, I wonder, it, so I was wondering if you had done like research on the right amount of detail, because I feel like you can definitely, like the Steam thing, right? Like people know how to leave a review on Steam. So. Uh, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, go ahead. I bet you're wondering about Steam versus that. And it's true. Like I said, you do have to know your platform, like Imgur. Like I said, don't put a call to action right away. Put it in a little bit later. You have to understand your platform. And it's a lot of testing. Like Twitter. Twitter's kind of like high school, where it's like you're trying to be cooler than you actually are. You know, you're like, I'm just a cool guy. Uh, Twitter, you don't put call to actions as much. Um, because if you use too many hashtags on Twitter, you're not cool. You're not one of the cool kids. Um, so Twitter, you gotta, the way you do your call to action is you have a viral tweet, but you make sure your pinned tweet has a good call to action or your bio has a good call to action. So it's again, you kind of have to know the culture. That's why I say don't do all the things when you're marketing, like specialize in one or two, because you really have to understand the culture of that, that platform so that you don't make a cultural faux pas like having a super long call to action in Twitter, which is like kind of... Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, I just wanted to ask about incentivizing the reviews. Uh, there's, you know, maybe you're aware of like uh, websites that reward you for leaving a review on a product or uh, give so many reviews you get uh, X value. And I was curious, like, if there's a way you could do that for your Steam games, like if uh, if a person uh, writes a review, they get like a cosmetic from your game or in-game currency. And so that's how you can't gift it. And you shouldn't do it. And if you, I'm not gonna flip through all the things, but if you do, if you look at my call to action for reviews, I never say leave me a good review. I just say tell me the pros and the cons. And then, but because they're on my email list and they've been buying my games, I know they're probably going to give me a good review because I've zeroed in an audience who likes me. And that's also why I kind of put that little bit of pathos, like, hey, you've liked my game, you've liked my, me for a while, why don't you leave a review? That's kind of like leave, kind of getting them there to do a positive review without being like, hey, leave a good review and I'll buy you a game. You know, that's, that's sleazy and actually illegal from the Federal Trade Commission. So. There are ways to get good reviews without <laughs> outright bribery. Okay. Kind of have a follow up to that, which was, uh, uh, what about incentivizing customer interviews? Like, how do you approach uh, finding these people? Do you kind of, do you kind of go, hey, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you about this game, um, and you know, give me a free iPod, or you just go, hey, I'll, I just want to know, I want to interview you about this game or genre. Like, how does, how does that first kind of conversation come? I mean, the good thing is you, we are making video games and everybody loves to talk about video games. Like, it's the best thing to do. It's like so fun to talk about video games. So it's not that hard. But sometimes what I do, like on Steam actually, it's, you can't just friend somebody. Like, you can't just chat with them. You have to friend them. You can chat directly on Reddit. But what I typically do is I actually give a free copy of my first game, like one screen platform, which is on sale for like $2 a dollar. So I'll, I'll give that game away for anybody who asks. I will give it away. Sometimes what I'll do is I'm, I'm working on a sequel to the game, so I'll actually give a free copy and say, like, hey, here's a free copy. And then, like, what? Why'd you just get... It's like I'm Santa Claus, just, like, descending from nowhere just to give them a free game. And then they've got, like, I've got their attention. And they're like, hey, can I ask you about... You left a review on Celeste, which is a platformer that's very similar to my game. Can I ask you what you like about Celeste? And they're like, sure, you just gave me a free game. You can do whatever you want. You know? And it's like that... Sometimes giving that, I, I actually told, a, I wrote a blog post about how to do this, and somebody tried a thing where they have an upcoming game and they said, hey, I will give you a copy of my game that's in progress if you answer my questions. Like, you know, when it releases, I'll give you a free copy. Just the promise of it, and people are like, sure, why not? Like, again, you're talking about video games. It's not like we're asking them about health insurance or something like, something boring. We're talking, we're, we're fucking dream makers here. We, we, we sell dreams. So people are, are willing to talk, it's not too hard. Is there uh, resources at all for statistics and data relating to different age groups of gamers, whether they be kids of different ages or 
types of games that people play, amount of downloads, types of games, Things like that. Yeah, um, Steam releases, they have blog posts where they write about their audience. So again, it depends on your platform. Um, and you can just, just, if you just Google like whatever your platform is, like Steam demographics or something, um, you can do that and then you'll, you'll see it. And there are companies like on mobile, there's like App Annie, there's other things. And you usually have to pay like maybe $30 a month and you get access to it. But if you're in the early phases, just pay for one month. Sometimes they give you a 14 day free trial, do all your, all your market research and then cancel the free trial. So there's tons of companies that will sell you that, that information. But again, it's not that expensive, like 30 bucks. So uh, the other resource that you can do is uh, release a game. Just like take your game jam games that you made, clean them up, polish them up, take like a month to polish them up and just put them on Steam. You can do it for a hundred bucks and people are gonna play it and they're gonna leave you lots of feedback. And if they kind of liked it, and they join your mailing list, I send out surveys to my mailing list. Like, who are you? Like, what's your age group? All this kind of stuff. And even um, MailChimp has a thing where they somehow, probably something unethical, they scrape their, again, the people, I, when I say email marketing, people give me their email address voluntarily. I, I put a sign up on my website and it says, join my mailing list and you'll get cool stuff from me. Um, when you, you can go on MailChimp and say, what's my demographic? And they'll give you a, an estimated breakdown of it. And I think they use public records or some way of figuring, I don't know how they do it, but they'll tell you like what social media platforms they use, what their typical age, what their gender apparently is. I don't know how they do it, but, um, so once you have an audience, you can actually get a lot of that information. Answer your question? Yeah. Good. I was gonna ask about the breakdown between say Discord and do you think email stay dominant, or do you think Discord's gonna figure out some secret sauce, or some other person might come around and, and scoop up both email or Discord and Twitter? Or? There's there's like an old saying like if something's been there for 25 years, it's probably gonna be here for another 25 years. You know, it's just like especially with the internet, some things just are like the backbone of the internet. You know, there's like some like core things. And nothing has ever beat email. And part of the reason is um, a couple things. Nobody owns email. Like Gmail kind of owns it because they're so popular, but nobody owns email. Like Discord is controlled by one company. And Facebook used to be the top, like people love to market on Facebook. And then Facebook, what do they do? You have to promote your post, right? They'll monetize it. I'm waiting for Discord to monetize to be able to reach your fans. And they, they'll do little changes like they moved um, alerts. So if you're in a folder and you're over a thousand subscribers on your Discord and you send out an everybody, they you won't get the little red badge. Like all these, anytime your social media platform is owned by a big corporation, they're going to do little ways to like needle it and change the algorithm and do all kinds of things. And that's why it's never going to beat email, which is like uh, just everybody's got it and it's decentralized. So the other thing about email is people are there for business. People. The reason it's so powerful for actually buying stuff is you go there to like get your bills. You, you pay your, it says like, hey, this new thing came in. Uh, your new payment came in that you have to pay or like credit card bill all comes in through email. So you're in a kind of business money mindset. So when you have a thing that says, hey, my game's on sale, I'll go pay for it. They're kind of like already primed for that. Whereas on social media, like Twitter, like I said, is like high school. It's kind of like a cocktail hour. So it's all of a sudden like you're coming in like sales, buy this, buy that, to like somebody who's just trying to like chat with their friends. Same thing with Discord. And I think that's why email always has that upper hand when it comes to e-commerce and actually selling things. It's because people are in a business mindset in there and they're hanging out with their friends on Twitter. And so you're like coming in as like some sleazy marketer on Twitter. That's, it's just like a fundamental aspect of email why I think it works so well. But that's just my, my theory, so. But if, if, if something does come better, I will change plans. Like I will, I will drop email and do some other thing, but there's, it's like the speed limit of the universe. Nothing beats email. It's like the speed limit of the internet. Nothing ever beats email. It's weird, it's weird. Anything else? What about those direct sales that uh, Discord has been trying to do? Uh, they actually canceled it. <laughs> uh, is it really? They, yeah, just, the thing. they just, um, they, they had like a store page yeah. and nobody bought from Discord because they were just hanging out with their friends and they'd say this game's on Steam and then they'd flip over to Steam, buy it through Steam and not Discord. <laughs> like Discord did everything they could and they still couldn't get people to buy the store. They just shut their own store down. So 
<laughs> As of like last week, right? I didn't even notice that the store had gone away. Exactly. <laughs> now, one, people didn't know it was there, and now people don't know it's gone away. <laughs> so, I mean, it's... Store? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, store this for a while. Same thing happened with Twitch, I think, because they're trying to get people to buy games through the streamers. It totally makes sense. Like, I don't know why it didn't take off. Like, imagine if the streamer said, you would support me, click this, and I get 10% of this. I would click it, like... Because who wants to open up Twitch to launch their game? Exactly. It's just like the same thing. If, if it's on Steam, then... Oh, it was a launcher, too. Yeah. That's what exactly. did it. Fuck that. Yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> there's just, some, there's like fundamental aspects that... Just that, it's again, it's that call to action where it's like, if you have to skip to a different platform, a different log, and a different thing, you're like... God damn. So every time you make somebody jump through another hoop, you lose them. And that's why you have to be so clear with your call to action. Because just such a high percentage are going to just disappear in the internet. All right. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks Everybody for. Give Chris a Thank you.